Let's start with uh, an early phase for you, which is back in 99, mm. when Putin becomes president. What was the word about him? Were you concerned about anything, mm. or was it? did you think it would be more of the same? You know, the, the late 90s were really a moment of still tremendous hope and optimism about the relationship between Russia and the United States. Uh, we had just signed the NATO-Russia Founding Act in Paris with President Clinton, and it's remarkable when you think about it because one of the things President Clinton said at the time in signing this was, we're no longer in a zero-sum world. This is a win-win where uh, NATO's uh, strength can be Russia's gain and, and Russia's success can be NATO's success. And that was really the atmosphere that we had. So I think when, when President Putin came in, uh, he was known to us. He had been national security advisor. In fact, I remember being in Europe uh, on a, at, a, at a summit with uh, the then national security advisor, Sandy Berger, and coming downstairs from our uh, hotel working area to give Sandy something, uh, at, he was at the bar, and he was sitting next to this guy, Vladimir Putin, first time I saw him. He was Sandy's counterpart as a national security advisor. So we knew him in that capacity. I don't think anyone uh, in the 1990s, um, the late 90s, anticipated that the Putin they knew then would become the Putin we know now. So when you first laid eyes on this guy, mm. who is he, what's his aspect, and what did you think? Well, he, he seemed like uh, he was a, uh, an old spy, sort of transformed into a, into a diplomat and then into a, uh, into a president. Um, and very uh, um, circumspect, but also, uh, again, according, especially according to the folks who were dealing directly with him, like Sandy Berger, very straightforward, uh, good, good to deal with, um, cards on the table. And, you know, remember, he'd come from St. Petersburg. He'd come from the very liberal side of the Russia House. And I think people anticipated that he uh, would continue the reform effort uh, begun by, by Gorbachev and then Yeltsin, uh, and that he would continue to advance Russia's integration uh, with the West and with the rest of the world. That was what we anticipated. And when did you know, get the strong uh, impression that it wasn't going to be a, a continuation of the democratic revival? I think really not until uh, Putin's in a sense, returned to the presidency. Uh, he um, had uh, given way to Medvedev. Uh, Medvedev was president. Putin was prime minister. It was not clear exactly what the relationship was between the two, whether Medvedev was an independent power, uh, power source. Uh, and Medvedev himself, at least in the early days, uh, had a very progressive line and seemed to want to pursue Russia's integration, wanted to build a Russia, a Russia Silicon Valley. Um, and so we were deeply engaged with him at the early part of the Obama administration now. Uh, and it was not clear whether Putin would remain um, the power behind the throne, a secondary figure, or whether uh, Medvedev was really truly a placeholder for him and he was on his way back. But as soon as he came back to the presidency, uh, we saw a tougher and tougher line. Let's go back to the reset moment. Mm. Um, why is it called the reset? It's called the reset because um, at the start of the Obama administration, we had the impression that the relationship between the United States and Russia uh, was at a low point and could and should be better. That despite our profound differences, there were so many areas where it made sense to try to cooperate and it was worth giving that a shot. And actually, Vice President Biden was the one who first advanced the reset. The very first foreign policy speech of the Obama administration was at the Munich Security Conference in February of 2009, and that was Biden, and that had the reset in it. But while everyone focused on the reset language, and the headline was, the United States wants a new relationship with Russia. If you read the speech carefully, um, you can see that there was a flip side to that. Biden was crystal clear that even as we sought a reset with Russia, we weren't going to renege on our basic principles. Uh, we weren't going to go back to a world of spheres of influence uh, in Europe uh, or beyond. We weren't going to accept the proposition that one country, like Russia, could tell other countries uh, what they should do or shouldn't do, with whom they should associate or not associate. So the reset was very balanced. It looked to a better relationship, it saw possibilities, but it also was clear about our basic principles. Hadley said at the end of the Bush administration, I think we threw our relationship with Russia in the toilet. Hmm. Um, from the beginning when Bush had said, I looked in his eyes and I saw mm -hmm. his soul and whatever, there seemed to be things that happened during those eight years that uh, Putin, as he tells the story, and Russians, as they tell the story, we didn't listen to uh, Putin, that we were in lots of ways demonstrating that we, uh, we didn't value mm. that relationship as much as we should have, and that it had angered Putin in some way that mm -hmm. revenge seemed to be on his list of things he wanted to do. What's your reaction to that? 
Oh, I think there's been a lot of talking past each other over the last 25 or 30 years. And the United States genuinely sought to advance Russia's integration into the West and into international institutions. And we genuinely sought to support Russia. We wanted a, a strong, successful Russia, not a weak and contained one. Uh, and we put a lot of money into Russia after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, trying to support it economically, trying to support democratic institutions. We sought a partnership uh, with NATO. Uh, later on, we were Russia's biggest champion for getting into the World Trade Organization. Um, Russia saw something very different, and certainly uh, Vladimir Putin did. He continued to see the United States trying to hold Russia down, to contain it. The enlargement of NATO seen from Moscow's eyes uh, was an effort uh, to keep Russia in its place. Uh, and Iraq certainly was uh, one chapter where uh, arguably uh, we didn't listen to Russia's views. Uh, and then if you fast forward, uh, Libya, uh, other places where uh, we engaged, uh, that just fueled Russian suspicions. So I think part of this narrative is the fact that we weren't uh, speaking the same language to each other. Now, I do think Russia got to a point under Putin in particular where even if we had been speaking clearly and directly, uh, we were going to be at odds because either Mr. Putin started with or developed a very zero-sum view of the relationship, and that's really the defining problem today. Through the Arab Spring, he, I mean, almost always from the very beginning, the way we hear it, he's, he believes America, that people aren't spontaneously ever gathering. That's you right. Know, that, you know, so the U.S. is in there, USAID that's is right. in there, somebody's in there fomenting these. Yeah, that's right. He saw America's hidden hand everywhere color revolutions left, right, and center, he thought the United States was behind them. Uh, it's not true, and it's an unfortunate misreading of what people really felt, uh, whether it was Georgia, whether it was Ukraine, uh, later uh, other countries. But certainly I think that's how um, Mr. Putin genuinely perceived it. And that too uh, created a lot of uh, animosity in the relationship. Did you really believe that man could, could the man who delivered the Munich speech mm -hmm. could hand it over to uh, to Medvedev and actually let him uh, be the president of Russia? Yeah, I think on balance, uh, we thought that uh, Putin was, would remain uh, the power behind the throne even when Medvedev was front and center. And certainly there was the, uh, the view that there was a pretty good chance he would try and come back and, and become president. But I, I've got to say, it wasn't 100%. There was certainly a period when we thought it was possible that um, Medvedev had developed his own um, uh, sort of center of gravity and source of power, and would contest uh, Putin's power, or Putin would uh, would let him continue to, to hold the reins. Uh, that was an open debate, uh, but then it became clearer and clearer that uh, no, Putin was uh, would remain uh, the power one way or the other. Were you at state or at the NSC? I was at the NSC at the, NSC at the first the six years of Obama. Okay, so uh, what does Obama think? Well, look, President Obama was uh, profoundly pragmatic. Uh, in uh, his view of most, most things, including the relationship with Russia. So no, there certainly wasn't a, a, a wide-eyed view that we were going to become partners and best friends, but there was a clear view that there were grounds uh, for cooperation, that it was in the self-interest of both countries to work together. And indeed, the first few years of the Obama administration, I think we proved that principle. We negotiated a new uh, strategic arms uh, control limitation treaty, a new start uh, that was good for the security of both countries. We cooperated with regard to Afghanistan, where Russia played a positive role, particularly uh, in letting our forces and our equipment uh, transit into and out of uh, Afghanistan. Russia was a good partner in dealing with the Iran nuclear problem uh, and played a productive role there. So in these areas and, and others, we thought there are grounds for working together. Uh, and wherever Russia sees it in its self-interest, and we see it in ours, we should. I guess it is in 2011 that the people rise up it was a bad election. Things are m messy. Hmm. Obviously, uh, it's been uh, maneuvered, uh, to put it mildly. Um, what did the White? What was the White House's perspective on on uh, uh, the the gatherings in uh, in uh, uh, Moscow and and Putin's response? Well, here too, there was a profound disconnect because we were seeing this from a distance. <laughs> we had nothing to do with it. And Mr. Putin thought, or at least said, he believed that we had everything to do with it. And in particular, statements that then Secretary of State Clinton made, uh, suggesting sympathy with uh, those protesting, uh, I think fueled uh, Putin's profound suspicion, if not paranoia, that uh, the United States was the hidden hand be behind these protests. I think he was, he was thrown by the protests. He was taken aback 
by the, um, the, the passion of the opposition and had to look for a, a place to point the finger. <laughs> he pointed it at us. For the United States, for the Obama administration, we saw this uh, as what it was, uh, which was a spontaneous um, uprising, a too strong word, but certainly a, a spontaneous reaction to Putin's overreach at home, uh, to the fact that he was quashing democracy in Russia, uh, that he was uh, building what turned out to be a kleptocracy uh, to keep himself in power. Uh, and that response from the people on the streets was a profound warning sign to him. When Medvedev says, oh, okay, we've decided to flip, but we're gonna go, we're gonna go back the other way, and, he, and uh, uh, he's, he's gonna come back, uh, Putin's gonna come mm -hmm. back into power. What did the president think of that? Well, I think all of us thought, and, 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 and including the president, that uh, it was going to be uh, challenging, that uh, we would uh, have to deal with Mr. Putin uh, as president, as the main power, and uh, he was taking an increasingly uh, confrontational role to the United States uh, and, and increasingly seeing the relationship in zero-sum terms. So that's, that's an evolution hmm. from the guy you watched come in when you're in the Clinton right. administration and the expectation that somehow there's going to be uh, uh, some kind of a partnership, hmm. maybe even a NATO membership, to wherever that is in 2012. Hmm. What happened? Well, I think there were, there were a series of events. Uh, we continued the process of uh, NATO enlargement, and we continued to keep the, an open door. Uh, that sent a message uh, to Putin that, uh, again, the United States, the West, was trying to hold him back, contain him. There had been the confrontation that started during the Bush administration over Georgia and Russia's invasion of Georgia. Uh, and then you saw this color revolution in Ukraine, even more significant from Russia's perspective because the largest country on its borders uh, the one where if democracy succeeded, if that model took hold in Ukraine, uh, it would sa send a very strong message to folks back in, uh, in Russia about what the alternative actually was. Um, and all of this is happening. Um, at the same time, uh, we have uh, Libya, and from Russia's perspective, it had supported a United Nations Security Council re resolution, uh, in a sense, uh, against its own better judgment. Um, and then when Gaddafi ended up um, losing power, Russia felt, uh, felt betrayed, felt that we had used a Security Council resolution that it had supported to commit regime change in Libya. So you take all of these things together, uh, and it just spirals up and up and up. And, and Putin, at that moment, 2000, now we're at 2012, mm. who is he then? So I think here's where we... We, we made a mis at least in my judgment, a misjudgment. We continued to believe uh, until pretty late in the game that Mr. Putin's interest and Russia's interest was in deepening its integration with the international community, with the West. Uh, and indeed, until very late in the game, we were the, the main champion for Russia getting into the World Trade Organization during the Obama administration. We thought that's where Russia wanted to go. I think what we misjudged, at least in, in my judgment, until uh, a little after, almost after the fact, was that Putin had gotten to the point where he had built this kleptocracy. That was the source of his power uh, in Russia. Controlling the money, finding sources of money, was absolutely essential to maintaining his hold on power, continuing to buy off elites. And an integrated Russia <laughs> that had to play by the rules, that had to be transparent, that had to be open, was totally antithetical to sustaining that kleptocracy. The two things couldn't go together. And so at a certain point, um, it became against Putin's personal interest to actually pursue Russian integration because he couldn't accept the rules, the transparency, the norms that come with that. Uh, that would undermine the kleptocracy that he was building. It took us a little while, I think, to figure that out. Um, but uh, by that time, we really were in the zero-sum world where, from Moscow's perspective, uh, Russia's strength was uh, our weakness and our gain was their loss. That's right. Uh, and he needed, it's like he still needs, uh, I guess, America to be the boogeyman. He needs to be able uh, to explain uh, why Russia uh, is having trouble at home, why its economy uh, is stagnating, uh, why it is not delivering for its own people. And this is classic. Uh, whenever you're, um, in one way or another, mismanaging your own country, you've got to point fingers somewhere else. And he's found it useful to point them at us and at the West. But there's something more profound going on. Um, 
for, for Putin, when Western democracy is successful, it's the most profound indictment of the system that he's built in Russia, a country that started to embrace democracy and capitalism after the end of the Cold War, but now again has turned into this kleptocracy, this illiberal democracy, uh, and indeed uh, self-recognized uh, illiberal democracy. And Putin, I think, came to the conclusion that the more he could do to undermine the Western democratic model, to foment trouble, to create um, tension, difficulties within the West, between the United States and Europe, within Western European countries, within the United States, um, the better he would be. He'd be able to say to his own people, you see, <laughs> their model's no better than ours. Uh, they lie, they cheat, they steal, they fail, <laughs> just like we do. So stick with what we've got. There's no difference. What, what was Estonia? What was, you know, what was that? Were those early probes? Was that an early development mm -hmm. of something that's going to manifest itself in our presidential election in 2016? I think Mr. Putin came to a few conclusions. One, of course, was, again, that the success of democracy, particularly on his borders, uh, was a real threat to, uh, to him and to the system that he'd built up. And so he had an interest in trying to throw some wrenches in the works wherever he could. Um, it's also true that he wanted to protect Russian-speaking populations uh, in these countries, saw himself as their, their guarantor uh, and their guardian. Um, and these two things combined uh, probably prompted him to uh, uh, look to see if he could uh, take advantage of the situation and make a little trouble. That was one thing. The other thing is he knows that he can't challenge a NATO country frontally, uh, militarily. Um, that would be to invite the full wrath of NATO. That would be to invite the United States into a conflict. He has no interest in that. Because of account. Article 5. Because of Article 5. Explain Article 5. So Article 5, uh, NATO says that uh, an attack on one member uh, of NATO is an attack uh, on all members, and everyone vows to uh, uh, come to uh, the defense in one way or another. It's not spelled out exactly how uh, of any NATO member that is under, under attack. So there's a real tripwire there. Uh, and a frontal military confrontation between Russia and a NATO country is not something that Putin or any Russian president would risk. But where he's very smart and very adept is using these so-called asymmetric tactics to push, to prod, to probe, to provoke without a frontal military assault. Uh, and it's everything from buying off politicians uh, and centers of influence, uh, misinformation campaigns, uh, very uh, under the radar, um, limited military probes and actions, um, supporting separatist forces in these countries, all of that taken together um, turns into an asymmetric strategy that with very few resources and with a much weaker hand can do tremendous damage. He can fight above his weight. He can fight way above his weight, and that's what he's been doing. I think Putin's been playing a weak hand very, very well. So uh, he's the center of attention in the world with the Sochi Olympics. Mm. Uh, but meanwhile, there's a bog fire burning underneath him uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, yeah. Crimea. Tell me the story from the way you guys learned about it, thought about it. We talked to Tori Newland and mm -hmm. others uh, uh, about their role. So t take me there. What's if it, take me to fourteen fifteen uh, and what the United States perspective is. So, in the fall of, of fourteen, um, Ukraine and its president uh, have vowed to pursue membership in the European Union. The people want it. That's the direction the country is taking. And as they're moving forward um, in that direction, the president does a very dramatic about face at Moscow's behest. And that provokes this revolution, uh, the Maidan, where people take to the streets because their president had promised to pursue Western integration, pursue a relationship with Europe, and he'd pulled the rug out from under them. At the same time, there was, um, I think, a view among the public that uh, corruption was just eating away at Ukraine. So it was these two things together. It was the broken promise of moving toward the West and corruption. These things together created the Maidan, brought thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets. And then the government, in a classic fashion, overreacted. And instead of letting people express themselves, uh, it started to use violence to, uh, to hold them back, to repress them. And this shocked uh, everyone in, in Ukraine. It started to shock people uh, around the world. 
And at that point, uh, the Europeans, the Western Europeans, got, uh, got deeply engaged. Um, our initial reaction was to um, support them, but to let them uh, try to work out some kind of arrangement to calm things down. And when it became apparent that uh, that wasn't succeeding, we jumped in. President Obama felt very strongly that we needed to work hand in hand with the Europeans to try to prevent some kind of mass violence uh, in Ukraine. And so we engaged directly with the Russians and President Obama uh, engaged directly uh, with President Putin multiple times to see if we could forge some kind of agreement, get a deal, get peace back, uh, prevent uh, a massacre. And indeed we did. Uh, and there was an agreement that um, the president, Yanukovych, would uh, serve out another uh, six months. There'd be an election, and we'd let the Ukrainian people sort this out. And just as that deal was, was agreed to and consummated, and we thought we'd had this, we put this back in the bag, <laughs> the president fled. And from Putin's perspective, we were somehow behind this. Um, and in the vacuum, uh, his own party, in effect, ceded power to more democratic uh, European-oriented forces. And Moscow saw another color revolution that had succeeded, a second one, in a sense, um, in Ukraine, and thought we were behind it. We had nothing to do with the president fleeing. In fact, um, the very day he fled, he'd had a scheduled phone conversation with Vice President Biden, and Biden was trying to get him on the phone. We couldn't find him anywhere. And indeed, it turned out he had left uh, Kiev uh, to, to flee. Uh, so all of a sudden, you have exactly what Russia sought to prevent which was the Democrats taking power in Ukraine, the very people who wanted to pursue the European orientation for Ukraine that Russia thought it had derailed in the fall of, uh, of 2014. And so they provoked a counter Maidan. They went into Crimea, and then they ginned up a crisis in Eastern uh, Ukraine, in the Donbass, a crisis that <laughs> didn't exist before they created it, uh, where they backed uh, a very small number of uh, separatist forces uh, who seized um, control of uh, a chunk of eastern Ukraine. And that's the crisis that we're living with today. Of course, um, he, he doesn't acknowledge, in fact, he outright lies about what they're doing, first in Crimea and then in that's right. the Donbass. He's these little green men. Mm -hmm. t t tell me that story. So Russia, again, this is a classic example of using asymmetric tactics. It didn't frontally invade Ukraine, either Crimea or uh, the, the Donbass, eastern Ukraine. Uh, it sent in small numbers of special forces who allied themselves with uh, local separatists, uh, gave them instruction, gave them equipment, gave them money, gave them direction, uh, and then Putin denied their presence. And it was striking because I remember multiple conversations between President Obama and President Putin. We would be in the Oval Office and the president would be on the phone with Putin, and Putin would be denying, and in fact flat out lying, about Russia's presence in Ukraine. <laughs> And Obama would say to him, Vladimir, we're not blind. We have eyes. We can see. And Putin would just move on as if nothing had happened. And it became very, very challenging because we were genuinely trying to find uh, a way out, an off-ramp, as we called it, for Russia uh, that restored Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, but also made clear that Russia's own interests could be upheld. We believe strongly that, and Obama told Putin, we know Russia has a unique relationship with Ukraine, history geography, culture, language, and there's no reason that can't be preserved. But the basic principle that we had enunciated in that famous reset speech in 2009 at the very beginning of the Obama administration, that also was sacrosanct for us. No spheres of influence, no larger countries changing the borders of smaller countries by force, no country telling the people of another country it's their direction with whom they could associate or not associate. So we had to uphold those principles. It was bigger than Ukraine, bigger even than Europe. But at the same time, it didn't have to be a zero-sum game. Putin disagreed. When, when Obama's talking to Putin on the phone, mm. what's, the, what's everybody's aspect? What's the vibe? Putin is extraordinarily calm, matter-of-fact. He doesn't get ruffled. He may say hard things, but he says them in a very calm, uh, almost matter-of-fact way. Uh, and in a strange way, uh, Obama uh, is, uh, is not dissimilar. Uh, he also is extremely even-keeled. So here you have two very even-keeled guys talking to each other. The difference is that, unfortunately, President Putin uh, simply speaks mistruth after mistruth and tries to misinform, but he does it as easily as he breathes. 
And and the president and President Obama's response to you guys after he hangs up? Well, there's a lot of uh, shaking of the head and saying, look, it's, it is challenging to deal with someone uh, who uh, simply doesn't tell the truth and evades the facts. But Obama was extraordinarily persistent, kept coming back at it, kept looking for ways forward. And, you know, we would make progress whenever the two of them managed to, to talk. They'd agree on some, uh, on some move that would try to calm tensions and see if we could find some kind of roadmap to getting out of the crisis. And that would, that would work for a few weeks, and then Russia would revert back to its previous tactics. It was a little bit like it had its, its hand on the rheostat. It wasn't an on-off switch in Ukraine. It would turn up the heat, turn down the heat, depending on how much heat we were exerting. But Obama led this very systematic, determined effort to, in a sense, go at the problem asymmetrically ourselves. That is to say, it made no sense for us, from Obama's perspective, to try to confront the Russians directly, militarily in Ukraine. They were there, we were not. They could mass force much more significantly than we could. Ukraine was not a NATO member. So the soft underbelly for Russia in Ukraine was not military, it was economic. Hence the sanctions, hence the effort by the United States to lead Europe in imposing very significant sanctions on Russia that made it pay a real price for its adventurism in Ukraine. So let's back up just a little bit. Um, uh, tell me about the, the Newland phone call with the ambassador mm -hmm. and, and why that seemed to matter at the time. Um, I think that Russia probably uh, interpreted that, that call as the United States being, the, uh, being a hand or a hidden hand behind what was happening in Ukraine, uh, which wasn't the case. Uh, we were defending our basic principles. We were defending our partnership uh, with Ukraine. But we were also trying to find a way forward to resolve the crisis, to calm things down, to make sure that violence didn't spiral out of control, uh, and to protect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. That was what it was about. But I think heard from Moscow, this probably just confirmed to Putin's ears uh, the United States as the actual power behind the throne in Ukraine. Everybody seemed really surprised that it was released. I mean, phone calls are gathered, wiretaps happen yeah. continuously. But for some reason, this one gets rolled out. It, does it, it, and to some, it signals a change in the way Russia, and Russia is going to act at moments like this. You know, I think Putin became very sophisticated in using, in a public fashion, uh, misinformation and and or even using information that it had acquired through traditional spying uh, means that normally wouldn't get then disseminated uh, in public or used. It would just be collected for informational purposes to figure out some kind of uh, weakness or leverage. What changed uh, were these so-called active measures where not only would the information be collected, but then it would be turned around and used in some way uh, against us or against, uh, against other countries. And Russia was becoming more and more sophisticated in doing this. And Putin saw this as a very cost-effective weapon. So this is, uh, there's also during this time a lot of fake news. Mm -hmm. There's lying. Yep. There's uh, active measures like taking over local newscasts and essentially uh, passing out uh, wrong information mm -hmm. as well. Are we, are we paying attention to that? Do we know that those things are going on or are they sort of on the margins? Oh, no, we were very focused and extremely concerned about uh, this increase in misinformation and, and Putin using, in a sense, our strength uh, against us. This is where he was extremely adept. Um, we have an open country uh, and an open collection of countries where information flows freely. Um, and increasingly, uh, information is in the hands of more and more people, the ability to, to use it with technology. <clears throat> and Putin turned that against us. He turned a strength of the United States, of the West, against us and made it uh, a weakness by using a misinformation, by, pro by using propaganda, uh, by lying. And this was very much at the center of our, our discussions and debates within the administration. We saw this happening, um, and it became a real challenge to figure out what to do about it and how to act effectively. Because what Putin was trying to do was, again, to show that um, everyone's lying, everyone's cheating, there is no objective truth. And there is no difference between what you hear from Western media uh, and what you hear in, say, Russia's media. Uh, that was the line, and he became increasingly successful in blurring it for people, including in the United States and the West. Now, what was interesting was 
You know, in Ukraine, we were in an information war. Putin was lying and denying that uh, there were Russians uh, in Ukraine when the uh, Malaysian airliner was shot down by separatists using a weapon that was wheeled in from Russia and given to them. Uh, Putin denied it. He created other, uh, other scenarios, other stories, tried to point the finger at Ukrainians, point the fingers at us, um, and muddy the waters. And we realized that we were in an information war, not a physical military confrontation, but an information war. And we spent an amazing amount of time trying to figure out how to fight it, to marshal the information, to get our intelligence community to release things that normally it wouldn't want to be uh, in public for fear of compromising some of its sources and methods. We wanted to see if we could put more into the public. Uh, and working with our own partners and allies to demonstrate to them that what Russia was saying was not true, uh, that uh, things that were in the European media about Russia having nothing to do with Ukraine, its soldiers not involved, nothing to do with shooting down the plane, that these were plain and simple lies. At the end of the day, the most effective resource that we had was President Obama's credibility. Because even when leaders and publics in Europe, say, might disagree with some of the policies that he was pursuing, they never doubted his word. And when he said it, they tended to believe it. You know, there's a famous story about the importance of the credibility of an American president. Uh, and that goes back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, at that point, we were implementing a quarantine of Cuba, and we needed to get our allies on board. And President Kennedy sent very senior emissaries to our major partners to convince them that uh, Russia had indeed put nuclear weapons on Cuba. He sent former Secretary of State Dean Acheson to our most prickly partner, France. And de Gaulle was then the president. And Acheson went in to see de Gaulle, explained the situation, and said to him, President Kennedy has authorized me to share with you our secret satellite photographs of these missiles. De Gaulle put up his hands and said, no, no, no. That's not necessary. If President Kennedy says it, I believe it. The word of an American president matters a great deal in these situations. Were there other conversations there must have been, and, and why didn't it fly to, to, to go tit for tat with him, play his own game? Hmm. If fake news is the way you want to play it, we can create some fake news. If uh, hmm. cyber war is the way you want to play it, we can get around and screw around with hmm. your economy. Well, that must have been raised. Why didn't it fly? You know, sure it got raised, but it's a but it got rejected because it's a very dangerous downward spiral. Uh, if we are suddenly uh, doing the same thing that Russia is doing, and we are no better than Russia, then Putin wins. He's right. <laughs> the very story he's trying to tell his public that there is no difference, that democracy is no different than the system he's established, this illiberal kleptocracy in Russia, then he's won. We've lost. If we don't hold on to our own values, to our own way of doing things, then he's right. So it was very important uh, to us to stand against what Russia was doing, but to do it on our terms, by our values, not his. We've talked to lots of people mm. about arming the yeah. uh, Ukrainians. The president decides not to do it. Can you take me into those arguments and, and, and tell me why the president landed where he landed? Yeah, look, it was a very tough and close call. And this was something that was deliberated and debated multiple times uh, at all levels of uh, the administration, the National Security Council, uh, including with, uh, with the president. And on the one hand, um, some of us believed that it did make sense to give the Ukrainians lethal defensive weapons, particularly anti-tank weapons, because at that point, one of the most dangerous things being used against the uh, Ukrainian soldiers were tanks that the Russians were providing to the separatists, or in some cases actually using themselves, and against which the Ukrainians didn't have an effective defense. And the argument was that uh, if they had these anti-tank weapons in their hands, they could start to do uh, a lot of damage, defend themselves, but also do damage, and maybe um, create a bit of a disincentive for the Russians to continue to do this because the Russians would start to lose forces uh, and they'd have to explain that back home. So that was one argument. Um, the other argument was that if we started to get into a tit for tat uh, with Russia on military grounds, um, that it would start to spiral up and we would put in more weapons, they would put in more weapons. We'd try to match it, they would um, surmount that. 
uh, and that that was going to be a losing game for us. Because again, from, for Russia, this was really existential, or at least for Putin, it was existential. And they were there. <laughs> we weren't. They were right on the border. It was very easy for them to get a lot of force in very quickly. We were always going to be behind in that game. What made the most sense was not to get into a military tit for tat that spiraled up, but rather to go at the soft underbelly, uh, which was Russia's economy. So at the end of the day, that's where President Obama came out. And I think Europeans, including Chancellor Merkel, uh, thought that that was the best direction to go in. But it was an ongoing argument uh, within the administration. Where were you? Well, look, I don't want to say, I think it's, it's, not, it's not appropriate. All I can say is my job was to give um, the president my best advice. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, but when he made a decision, uh, we carried it out. And the argument that he's a schoolyard bully, somebody's got to step mm -hmm. up and say, stop this. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's road testing mm -hmm. hard power and other stuff, and he's you gotta be, if you do it, he'll back down. Yeah. Well, a few things. First, it's not as if we weren't doing anything on the defensive side of the ledger. To the contrary, we were providing a significant amount of equipment uh, to the Ukrainians, um, defensive in nature, but very important. Uh, we were providing increasing amounts of sophisticated training to them, and that started to show real results over the course of a couple of years. Um, and of course, we were providing very significant economic support. That's on one side of the ledger. On the other side of the ledger, um, while Putin seemed to be having some tactical success, it was our strongly held view that he was not heading in uh, a positive strategic direction in terms of Russia's interests. Because in a sense, everything he was trying to prevent, he was in fact precipitating. This intervention in, in Ukraine cost him a relationship with the vast bulk of the Ukrainian people far into the future. Russia is now hated in much of Ukraine. NATO was dramatically re-energized by Russia's intervention in Ukraine, led by the United States. Our presence, uh, including in countries bordering Russia, is much more regular and significant than it was before the crisis. Europeans became more united when it comes to energy security, uh, again, because of this. And so across the board, uh, Russia actually strategically was getting into a weaker position. And then, of course, the sanctions, most important, together with the fall in oil prices and Russia's own mismanagement, was gutting the Russian economy far into the future. So tactically, yeah, Putin was doing pretty well. Strategically, a very open question. Gives him lots of ammunition to be pretty pissed off at us. It does. And again, I think it fueled uh, his own uh, worldview. And it fueled the sense of a zero-sum relationship. And this despite repeated efforts by President Obama to try to find an off-ramp for Russia to try to demonstrate that there could be uh, a win-win, uh, not a win-lose. Um, but obviously, we were not successful. Let's go back just for one minute and mm -hmm. capture one of the other motivational things. You've mentioned it, but I just want to make sure we, we, we get your thoughts mm -hmm. on it. This idea that Hillary, by talking in 2011 mm -hmm. uh, on that audio tape and on the web, sort of encouraging people to mm -hmm. stand up or whatever she did. Yeah. Uh, at the time, and as you look back on it, uh, strong motivation for, for, for Putin vis-a-vis -a, -vis a specific Secretary of State? Well, I think Secretary Clinton, being such a well-known figure around the world, um, having, um, I think, not only recognition around the world, but great respect around the world, uh, when she spoke out, people listened. Uh, it made a difference. But <laughs> she wasn't egging the protesters on. She was simply standing up for their right to make their, their voices heard and uh, for there to be uh, democracy in Russia, which was what the Russians purported to want and what we strongly supported. Uh, and again, Mr. Putin, I think, saw this as a real threat. He saw her and thus us as somehow instigating the protests, not simply supporting the right of the protesters uh, to speak out. Uh, and he was deeply, deeply concerned that if he didn't put a stop to it, this could spiral out of control and begin to really threaten uh, his, uh, his rule in Russia. Did she know how angry he was and, and that he was blaming her? Well, I think we knew at the time that he was certainly not happy about it. Uh, but whether anyone thought, uh, fast forward, that um, this would become a causus belli uh, for Putin to try to uh, prevent um, Secretary Clinton from becoming president of the United States, <laughs> I don't think anyone would have imagined it in the moment. So it's, let's go to the summer of 2016, or the spring maybe. What was the earliest time when you had a pretty good idea it was Russia? Well, at least in my case, and at this point I was at the State Department, no longer at the White House. Um, the summer 
uh, of that year, July uh, into August, um, we were seeing increasing signs and increasingly troubling signs that Russia was trying to meddle in the election. And what we first thought was happening was that Russia was actually trying to get into our electoral systems and uh, somehow uh, affect the result. Uh, and this caused us to go into overdrive to make sure that uh, we could defend the integrity uh, of the elections. And a massive effort was made to make sure that the election systems themselves were secure. We determined that they were. Uh, we, we, we determined that precisely because um, it's a decentralized system uh, and these things are not connected uh, to each other, it would be very hard uh, for Russia or any other country to actually physically affect uh, the outcome of an election. But that was the first concern that was raised. Then we thought that actually what Russia was trying to do was not so much necessarily actually affect the outcome, but create doubt about the integrity of the election. Even if it couldn't uh, switch one vote or deny one vote, if in people's minds um, there was something wrong with the election, that would do uh, its job for it. And that became our assessment of what Russia was up to. It was only later, much later, that the intelligence community determined that not only was Russia trying to sow doubt about the election, it was actually trying to prevent Mrs. Clinton from winning and help Mr. Trump win. Cozy Bear is in the State Department mm -hmm. and the Defense Department mm -hmm. and the White House. Mm -hmm. You're probably just getting to state then? Mm -hmm. uh, did you guys know about that? I think what, what changed, what we, what, we, what we saw and what we didn't um, arguably understand right away was when we saw Russia making these various efforts early on, we believed that it was traditional spy, uh, spy games. Uh, and <laughs> everyone does it. And we're trying to get information about them. They're trying to get information about us. And usually that information is put away somewhere. It's, it's analyzed. Uh, maybe they find a way to create leverage against someone. Uh, it builds their information base. What was new uh, was turning it around and actually actively using it uh, against us to affect some kind of outcome, in this case, the election. That's what took a while to, to come into sharp focus. That's the, that's the addition of WikiLeaks. That's right. for two DC leaks, all of that. That's right. When you hear that, you know something else is afoot. Yeah, this is a, this is a whole new game. And we went into, uh, into overdrive. First, again, protecting, making sure we could protect the uh, integrity of the system, but then um, confronting the Russians directly. Uh, and that involved John Brennan, the CIA director, putting his Russian counterpart on notice, I believe in August uh, that year. And then a couple of things happened. Um, we thought that the most effective way we could push back against the Russians was to send a very strong bipartisan message of concern. And so in August, uh, Brennan and other leaders of the intelligence community, as well as our top counterterrorism and homeland security person at the White House, Lisa Monaco, went to Capitol Hill to talk to the leadership about what we had learned and what we were seeing uh, in terms of Russia's efforts to uh, meddle in the election. And they talked to the senior uh, eight leaders in, in Congress, the so-called Gang of Eight. And to our shock, um, some of these leaders uh, refused to believe what they were hearing from the director of central intelligence and accused us of playing politics to help Mrs. Clinton win the election and thus rejected the idea of some kind of um, bipartisan statement of concern and determination not to let this stand. That was a very, very unfortunate moment. What did you chalk it up to? Uh, all I can chalk it up to is the hyper-partisanship uh, in Washington. Um, and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I suppose one might conclude that um, those who refused uh, to believe what the director of the Central Intelligence Agency was telling them, uh, in a sense that they believed Russia and Vladimir Putin <laughs> more than they believed their own director of Central Intelligence, well, I don't know how to, how to interpret that. I think it's deeply, deeply unfortunate, deeply troubling, and it really set us back because it took a month uh, beyond that to get to the place where finally we got a bipartisan expression uh, of concern from, uh, from Congress. In between, um, President Obama directly confronted Mr. Putin uh, at the G20 summit uh, in China. Did you happen to be there? I, I was not there, but uh, was involved in the preparations for, uh, for that summit and, and certainly got the uh, account of what happened. Um, and he gave him a very clear uh, stark warning that if Russia's meddling didn't stop, 
there would be significant consequences. And what's interesting is, as best we could tell, after that meeting, um, Russia seemed to pull back. We didn't see uh, these efforts uh, continue to try to get information and turn it around. But the damage had already been done. A lot of the information, of course, in the DNC uh, from the Clinton campaign had already been exfiltrated. Then it been passed on to cutouts like WikiLeaks and, and others. And it continued to um, trickle out even after the encounter between uh, President Obama and President Putin. But Russia's own direct efforts seemed to be, uh, uh, seemed to be held, held in abeyance. Did you, uh, were you, were you around as part of the preparation for, for Hung Zhou? Was there a, uh, uh, was there actual language worked out with the president? What to say to Putin? Uh, was there a plan for him to buttonhole him and pull him aside? Oh, very much so. Yeah, so very much so. Help me, help me with the preparation. No, it was for determined that. that that absent getting directly to Putin and absent it being the president of the United States doing it, uh, we were not going to um, uh, get a very uh, get a clear message to Moscow. And in the Russian system, in particular, unless you're dealing directly with Putin, you can send any message you want. It's not going to have the same effect. So President Obama believed that the uh, most effective way to um, get the Russians to stop what they were doing was for him to confront Putin directly, and that's exactly what he did. So what were the, what were the options? What could he have done besides just say what he said? Was there some, some, anything else? Sure, and of course we um, put together a series of possible responses and indeed possible punishments that were in our, um, in our toolkit. Um, and the main thing, though, was this. First, we wanted to make sure that, as a, as a practical matter, Russia could not, in fact, interfere in the electoral systems themselves. And that's why we worked very, very closely uh, with all the states, did an intense analysis of the electoral systems, determined that they were, in fact, safe and that their integrity could be preserved. Second, we wanted Russia to stop what it was doing. And it seems from the, uh, the meeting between Obama and Putin that after that, they did. And third was the question of, what is the uh, appropriate punishment? And there we thought that we have time. We can, uh, we can work on these different options. And at the same time, because it was our belief that Russia's primary objective was to sow doubt in the integrity of the system, even if it didn't actually do anything to the uh, system to change a vote or deny a vote, that the more we played this up in public, <laughs> the more we would actually be playing Russia's game. If the President of the United States got on the bully pulpit and started talking about this in the midst of a campaign, even if it was to say, Russia's trying to do this, but don't worry, everything's fine. Actually, that would probably just gin up concern and start to raise questions about the integrity of the system, exactly what Russia was trying to achieve. So we thought then that the better uh, approach was to be very clear and very direct with the Russians in private, to make sure that the system was protected, uh, and then in a deliberate way, maybe after the election, um, make the, uh, take the appropriate measures in terms of actually punishing Russia for what it did. In retrospect, I think if we had come to the conclusion earlier that Russia was actually trying to um, uh, deny one candidate the presidency uh, and give it to another candidate, you know, maybe we would have um, spoken out more forcefully in public. But given what we thought Russia was trying to do at the time, we didn't want to do anything that would play into its hands. And I suppose, you tell me, but I suppose if you believed that Hillary Clinton was going to win, which almost everybody, mm -hmm. it seems like, did at the time, mm -hmm. it would create a different strategy. Look, I, you know, I really think that from the perspective of President Obama, uh, the issue was, <laughs> what is the right thing to do to make sure that we are protecting the integrity of the electoral system, that we are making sure that we don't advance what Russia is trying to do, which was to create doubt in that system, and then in a deliberate fashion to decide uh, what the the right response was, that was what was motivating him, uh, not who was going to win the election, who wasn't going to win the election. Um, and it really, again, wasn't until after the election that the intelligence community came to the conclusion that there was a very deliberate effort by the Russians to affect the outcome of the election, not just to sow doubt in its legitimacy. You, you can see why it's viewed by many as yet another dithering sort of tactical mm -hmm. mistake by uh, President Obama. Look, there's one other element that's very important. Uh, besides this direct confrontation between um, President Obama and President Putin in September at the G20, in early October, the Director of National Intelligence and the Director of Homeland Security issued an unprecedented public statement about 
Russian interference in the election. Um, normally, <laughs> that would have been the dominant story. But of course, that very same day, the infamous Access Hollywood tapes were released. And this unprecedented statement by two leaders of our uh, intelligence and homeland security community was drowned out and lost. Well, and in fact, I think that day, WikiLeaks started to make its big dump of information, too, from the Podesta file. That's right, and it certainly raises questions in people's minds. But what are those questions? Well, it, it would seem that uh, time and again, um, information started to come out at particularly um, interesting times when uh, sort of um, juxtaposed against what was happening in the campaign. But maybe that's all coincidence. Well, what are you trying to say? No, I just think that one of the things that, of course, the uh, various investigations are looking at is whether there was any kind of active collusion uh, between anyone involved in the, in the campaign uh, and Russia. And it certainly at least raises the question, the uh, coincidence of some of these things coming out uh, at particularly advantageous moments for one campaign and disadvantageous advantageous moments for another campaign, that at least creates questions. Um, so all of this will be investigated in due course. Your thoughts about Trump's in the initial response where he essentially says, hey, Russia, go look at Hillary Clinton's emails. Well, I think what was troubling about um, Mr. Trump's response during the campaign itself was that um, his own talking points could have been taken right from uh, the airwaves of Russia Today, RT, uh, or Sputnik, Russia's propaganda organs. The line they were putting out was that the, our election would be, was rigged. And Mr. Trump was saying exactly the same thing. Uh, unwittingly, it seems, advancing the very narrative that Putin and Russia were putting forward. That was deeply unfortunate. So Trump wins. What did you see when you looked at Putin's response, Russia's mm. response? What did you see? Well, I think one of the things that that we saw uh, was that, um, on the one hand, Russia had arguably uh, just committed the most successful uh, misinformation and meddling campaign in, in, a, in an election uh, that we'd, uh, we'd ever seen. And that um, raised profound questions, not just about the election that had, that had just taken place, but about future elections, because given its success, um, it had every incentive to continue. Uh, that's one of the reasons that, that, that President Obama took the steps that he did after the election. But it's also one of the reasons why, going forward, there has to be a clear, definitive line uh, about uh, what Russia did. And of course, our intelligence community uh, and the three major agencies that investigated this were unanimous in their conclusions. Um, there has to be a very clear message to Moscow that this cannot happen again, and it will not happen again with impunity. And ultimately, the President of the United States is the one who has to deliver that message. It's a message that President Obama delivered when he was President. Uh, it's a message that President Trump now must deliver uh, if we're going to stop uh, the Russians from meddling again. And by the way, this is not a partisan issue. This time, Democrats were the victims. Next time, it could be Republicans. Um, this is an American, a nationals issue, uh, and a place where we have to stand united as Americans in standing up against it, uh, doing something about it, stopping it. Uh, but that starts with the President of the United States. If he's not speaking clearly about it, if he's not acting deliberately about it, the message Russia gets is, we can keep doing this. You, I think you wrote or said uh, that Putin is the master of the game. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? He has taken it to an art form to take a relatively weak hand, uh, a country that is in a very difficult strait economically, uh, that has a declining population, declining life expectancy, um, and is um, struggling. <laughs> he's taken that very weak hand and played it incredibly well. And the art form that he's perfected is particularly in the, in the information space. Taking our very openness, using it against us. Manipulating information, lying, deceiving, 
uh, and creating doubt. And that doubt is a very powerful thing. It takes away our own certainty, our own conviction, our own confidence that our system and values uh, really are better and stronger. Uh, it creates doubt in the minds of our own citizens. <laughs> and it tells his own citizens in Russia that there really is no difference. And that helps him sustain his grip on power. So I've never seen anyone uh, better at doing it than, than Mr. Putin. And it, it, it begs for, it demands um, a clear, deliberate, coordinated response, uh, not only from the United States, but from our partners across the board. We've seen the, the beginnings of that. I think the, the French election demonstrated that um, you can be uh, very effective in pushing back and diluting these efforts by Russia to interfere in an election. But it has to start at the top. It has to start with our own president, making clear that there will be real consequences for Russia if it continues down this path. And there's the argument, of course, that Obama made, which is, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to hot something up hmm. right before a new president comes in. That's right. And my job is to lay a little bit low. And if he wants to, if he wants to turn the temperature up, let him do it. That's exactly right. And I think uh, President Obama felt that we would, uh, we needed to put all of this together, hand it off to the next president, uh, and let him or her decide what the uh, appropriate follow-on actions would be. And indeed, he asked uh, that our intelligence community uh, come together and try to issue a definitive report about what happened. It was in that process of going back over every single piece of information and intelligence that they came to the conclusion that they hadn't reached before the election, that Putin was actually trying to affect the outcome of the election. That is, he was trying to make sure that Mrs. Clinton didn't get elected and trying to make sure that Mr. Trump did get elected. That was really a product of this look back at everything we had and everything we knew, putting pieces together that we hadn't seen connected at the time. And of course, the alternative, the counter argument to Obama, to the one I just articulated is, but wait a minute, uh, now you know it's Trump, mm -hmm. why not? go hell-bent for leather because you know where Trump is on this. Trump has been encouraging the Russians. Well, you very much hope and believe that whoever is elected president of the United States is going to do the right thing and stand up for the national interest and for the nation's security. And it was our uh, belief and conviction that um, President Trump uh, should and, and would do that. And it was our responsibility to give him the information that had been developed by the intelligence community, not by uh, a Democratic president, but by the intelligence community, um, to give him our best uh, recommendations for what should be done. But ultimately, it would, be, um, it would be his responsibility. Now, of course, the Obama administration did take action while it was still in office, including um, kicking out about 35 Russian so-called diplomats who were, in fact, engaged uh, in uh, intelligence collection and spying closing down two compounds that the Russians were also using for intelligence purposes, um, and uh, the president having previously put um, Putin on notice, uh, we uh, reserved the right and hoped the administration that followed us would reserve the right to take further action if Russia continued. Um, but now that responsibility, that power, uh, lies with the current administration, not with the Obama administration. And one can spend a lot of time revisiting what we did or didn't do. Um, and it's always important to, to look back and s figure out if you could have done something differently or better. But that's no longer the issue. The issue is, how do we make sure this never happens again? And that is the responsibility of the current administration and of President Trump. So in the end, you know, what did he achieve? And sort of what does it say about the Putin that you, you've seen evolve over the years? Well, I think Mr. Putin has been remarkably successful in, in fueling a crisis of, of confidence uh, in the United States uh, and in the West, particularly about our elections, but, but even more broadly uh, about our system. And whether that was his design from day one or whether he simply took advantage of opportunities that he helped to create, hard to say. Uh, but either way, he's been remarkably adept. And we are now consumed with what Russia did or didn't do during the elections. Uh, what the uh, can't what one campaign did or didn't do in collusion with Russia uh, and that has become the dominant story every single day uh, in our country uh, to such an extent that um, it's also made it difficult to move on with other things that are important um, but 
it's vitally important that we get to the bottom of this if we're going to prevent it from happening again. But to the extent that <laughs> Mr. Putin has played a very weak hand to dominate uh, our own national conversation, uh, to create doubt, uh, to create this, uh, this crisis of confidence, and to further uh, political paralysis in terms of getting anything done, he's been remarkably successful uh, playing a very, uh, a very weak hand. Uh, and again, that's why it's so vitally important that he understand that this cannot and will not happen again with impunity. And it really is up to the President of the United States to deliver that message directly to Mr. Putin, to make sure he understands it, believes it, and acts accordingly. Otherwise, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. We'll get a repeat of this in 2018, in 2020. Things will get even worse. Um, and uh, Russia will uh, emerge strengthened, uh, will emerge weakened from this. Now, one hopes uh, that sometime, somehow, some way, we can get back to a place where the relationship between the United States and Russia is not zero sum, where we actually are working together in areas of, of mutual self-interest. Um, but unless Mr. Putin can be made to see that acting in this fashion looking at the world through this zero-sum prism uh, and trying to undermine uh, the United States, uh, Western Europe, on a regular basis, unless he can be made to see that it actually is not going to be uh, allowed, that there are going to be real consequences for it, he'll continue. Um, because every signal he's getting is that it's working uh, and he's not paying a price for it. So this really is an urgent issue. Um, for the United States going forward. And again, the buck stops with the President of the United States. He is the single actor in our system who can make clear to Putin that this has to stop, it must stop, and if it doesn't stop, there'll be consequences.